Amen. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Your Bibles or your Bible apps, whatever you have, whatever you're reading from uh, today. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to uh, f- page 1132 and you will find 1 Corinthians 3, our text for the day. And, and if you don't have a Bible and you want to read God's Word, then uh, I'm just going to invite you to take one of those with you when you leave. That's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. So have you ever done a remodeling project at your house, a home improvement project? You know, maybe you've uh, installed a fan or you've, uh, you know, redone the flooring or maybe you redid a bathroom, uh, decided you had to paint something, add on, redo the kitchen. Anyone ever done any project at your house at all? Okay, a lot of hands go up. How many of you have ever had one of those projects go bad? Yeah, see all those hands that just went up? That's why I don't do them anymore. Okay, I don't like failure, and I'm so good at it. So, uh, and, and part of that is the way I was raised. I, as a child, uh, my parents went through what I like to call their insane years. Uh, and, and, and you'll understand why when I explain it. They weren't clinically diagnosed, of course, but that was just my, uh, you know, 10-year-old diagnosis. Uh, they decided that they were going to build their own house. They'd always done the, you know, the fix-it-up projects and stuff, but they got this crazy idea in their head that we're going to build our own house. A lot of you built your own house quote unquote, but no, they decided they were going to do all of it. Like, you know, whatever the contractors could do, they could do. They could figure it out, learn it, they could do it better. And, and so they, we did, we, we did it all. We did the concrete, the framing, the roofing, the, the drywall, we did the plumbing, the electrical, all of it. And, uh, and at the end of that, you know what they figured out? It was a lot harder than they thought. It took a lot longer than they thought, and it cost more than they thought. And so what's the sane reaction to that discovery? Let's do it again three more times. Because now we've figured out how to do it right. And, you know, of course, they did sub out the hard stuff then, so they did learn something. But uh, today we're kicking off a series called Building a House of Faith. Uh, And it's all about remodeling our lives, building our families, uh, fixing up our spiritual homes. And uh, we hope that it's going to bless you. We hope it's going to bless you whether you're married or single, whether you have kids at home or, or not. Uh, we believe that this is going to help all of us because we all need help. We all need help. A- and the good news is we have help. Because the moment you confess Jesus is Lord, God the Holy Spirit moved into your life and he began a remodeling project so that your life and your family could reflect the glory of God. So that you could look like Jesus in the way that you live your life. And so God is remodeling our lives. He wants to build our lives and he wants to build our families to reflect the glory of God. And and so we're going to spend... the next month, kind of talking about this, this project that God is working in your life and in my life. And the first thing that we need to know about our spiritual remodeling project is that you are responsible for building your life. You are responsible for building your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 10, the Apostle Paul is writing to a church made up of people a lot like us. Now the church in Corinth was like the most messed up church in the New Testament. Uh, They had all kinds of problems. Paul had to write them a couple of times, long letters, addressing things. So uh, let's listen to what he says at this point. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. You're responsible for building your life. This is a do-it-yourself project with the Holy Spirit as your life designer and teacher. He's the one who's guiding us on how to remodel our lives. And we are warned by the Apostle Paul in verse 10, let each one take care how he builds. 
Let each one of us take care how he builds. And, and so we've got to, to be warned. The first thing he tells us is make sure the foundation has to be Jesus. The foundation has to be Jesus. Uh, did you catch that, verse 11? For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul's the one who went to Corinth and who shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with them, and people understood that he is the one who can change their life. And, and so he said, look, I taught you this. Build your lives on the foundation of Jesus, because if you want a strong, healthy life, if you want a strong, healthy family, then you have to experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. So have you come to that place where you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world? You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins. You believe that he was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. If not, then this is where the journey begins. By you saying, hey, you know what? I want Jesus to change me. I surrender my life to him. God, remodel my life the way you want it. I need your help. So has Jesus changed your life? Have you experienced that life-changing relationship with him? As you sit here this morning, do you know that your sins are forgiven? Because if you're not sure, we would love to talk with you. I mean, if you know you haven't taken that step and you're ready to do that, God's speaking to you right now, then it's as simple as saying, I surrender, uh, Jesus change me. I'm yours. But if you want to talk to someone, we're going to have members of our prayer team available after the service. And they're up here at the front, and they're just waiting for you because they want to pray with you and encourage you and help you understand that relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, we have pastors available at both Connection Centers who would love to talk to you after the service so that you can be sure that you've started this journey of a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Because the foundation has to be Jesus. And then Paul tells us that how you are building your life will show. How you're building your life will show. Uh, look at verses 12 and 13 again. He says this. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, so you've got a choice of your materials that you're going to use, each one's work will become manifest, revealed, for the day will disclose it. What does he mean, the day? He's talking about judgment day. The day, the great and terrible day of the Lord, when everyone's lives will be laid bare. He says it's going to be revealed by fire. And fire will test the quality of your work. Fire. Think about those materials that he just listed. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. How do you think they're going to do with fire? Uh, how, wood, hay, and straw. What is that to fire? Fuel, right? That's going to burn up. Gold, silver, precious stones. Those are going to last. Fire is not going to eradicate them. It's not going to do them. In other words, cheap materials won't last. To build a family that is strong and healthy, it's going to require commitment and sacrifice and determination. In other words, we can't cut corners on our spiritual investment and expect positive results. We just can't do it. And, and in fact, Scripture tells us that. I mean, we know it by, by just simple logic, but Scripture actually affirms that. The Apostle Paul, Galatians chapter 6, let these words resonate. He says, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. If he sows to the flesh, he will from the flesh reap destruction. But if he sows to the Spirit, he will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So we're going to reap what we sow. The, the materials that we use in our lives uh, are going to show in our lives. So if you want a great life, invest wisely. If you want a healthy family, choose to commit, choose to sacrifice, choose to invest with great materials. And then thirdly, if you want a great family, build on God's word. Build on God's word. Uh, I'd encourage you to turn back over a bunch of pages to Matthew chapter 7, page 966, if you've got a Bible like mine. Uh, and I'm going to read this passage, uh, just verses 24 through 27, but I'm going to encourage you to, to go home and today or during the week, read Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Let these words of Jesus just kind of marinate in your soul. Jesus says this, it's at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So he's been preaching already for, for a while. And he says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. 
And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell. And great was the fall of it. Build your life on God's word. God's wisdom leads to a strong life. Not just knowing his wisdom, but in doing his wisdom. Putting his words into practice. There's so many people who are building castles on sand. Looks great for a season, but it's not going to last. You guys ever seen those giant sand sculptures that they do at the beaches and things like that? Isn't that the coolest thing? And I go, I don't know how they do that, and that's really cool, but it's not going to last. When it rains, when the, when the tide comes in, you know, it, it, it's going to crumble. So we want to build a strong life. What do we need to do? We need to listen to Jesus. Uh, you know what that means? That means read your Bible. The reason we give these away is because we want you to read them because we know if you read them and you do what it says, your life will be changed. So read your Bible. Uh, pray as a couple. Pray as a family. Uh, join a life group. We're going to have sign-ups here in a couple of weeks. Connect with other people who want God to change their life for the good and, and share life with them. Learn together. Uh, make God a priority in your life and you will reap life. You see, you and your family are worth the investment in gold and silver and diamonds. I believe that. I hope you do too. But know this, you're responsible for building your life. And, and we, want to, we want to help you build it strong. We're rooting for you. And, and so we're going to talk about remodeling our spiritual lives and fixing up our families. And we're going to do that by looking at one room of our lives at a time. Uh, you, you equate your, your life with your house. And so today we're kicking it off by talking about the living room. The living room. That's why we have this beautiful living room set up here. Living room. How many of you grew up in houses with formal living rooms? Okay, a lot of hands went up. All, all the houses that we built, all the houses that I grew up in, really until just uh, the last 20 years or so, had a formal living room. You know, and the formal living room had the, the fancy chairs. You know, it had the, all the really cool looking stuff. It had the luxurious couch that... We were not allowed to sit on. <laughs> right? You guys with me on that? You couldn't, you couldn't sit on the couch. We had, a, we had a couch in the other room, the family room, the den, whatever you call it in your family. You know, that's where you could sit on the couch. That's where you could be comfortable. You could be messy. You could eat in there. God forbid you bring food into the living room, right? You, you know, hell hath no fury like a mom who sees you with food in the living room. And... And so, uh, you know, our living room wasn't for living. Our living room was for guests and special occasions. You know, we wanted to look good. You met people in the living room. So the reality was we had one room for appearances and one room for life. So let me ask you a question that I, I hope you'll ponder uh, way beyond this morning. Is your faith authentic? Is your faith authentic? Or, honestly, is your faith like the living room that I grew up with? It's only for holidays and special occasions and when people are looking. And, and, and this is a crucial question if you want to build a family of faith. This is, this is so important. I cannot overstate this. Uh, because most of us that are people of faith want our kids to grow up and, and be adults that have faith. I mean, Jesus is important in our lives. We want Jesus to be important in their lives. And the number one determining factor on whether or not kids continue in their faith as adults is if their parents have authentic faith. If their parents' faith is real and authentic, then the kids tend to stick with Jesus. They tend to stick with faith. They tend to stick with church. And, and so it's a, that's why it's so important. And may, maybe a lot of you have read the reports that the majority of kids who are going up in church aren't sticking with it as adults. And maybe some of you are praying for your adult children because they haven't stuck with your faith and, and, and you're grieving and you're praying and you're hoping that they're going to come back to faith. And, and, and the reality is that this is the biggest factor 
adults having that authentic faith passes it on to your kids. So parents, if you love Jesus, there's a good chance your kids will. But that also means if church is a special occasion or convenience, there's a good chance your children will walk away from their faith and from the church. So is your faith authentic? And how do you know? How do you know if your faith is real or if it's uh, just for appearances? So let me just share three markers for authentic faith. And I'll allow you to kind of have a conversation with God about your life and your faith because it's not, you don't have to answer this question for me, but you and God need to have a conversation about it. So first thing is authentic faith is visible. It's visible. Now, if you're taking notes, write down next to visible, not showy. Visible, not showy. Uh, in other words, we're not talking about bumper, sticker, t-shirt, share on Facebook if you love Jesus kind of faith. I mean, because that's not, that's showy faith. That's the kind of faith that you want people to see. And by the way, while we're talking about Facebook, can I just tell you that when you, you know, kind of put something on there that shows up on my feed that says, if you love Jesus, type amen and share this of any type of variety, that is so annoying. <laughs> can I just, can I just encourage you to stop that? If, uh, look, God's not going to bless you because you share something on Facebook. I don't care what somebody else says. That's just not reality. That's not how he works. That's not how we work. That, that, so, you know, that's not really visible faith. Uh, you know, visible faith is not uh, always having your language be, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, God bless you, amen. Uh, you see, Jesus talked a lot about authentic faith, and usually in, in kind of a negative way. He, he told the story of, of a Pharisee who was the religious guy and a sinner, a tax collector, going to the temple to pray. And, and, and the, the Pharisee told God, aren't you glad I'm with you and I'm not like this sinner over here? And, and the sinner just fell on his face and begged God for mercy. And Jesus said, guess which one went away forgiven? The sinner. In, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, be careful not to practice your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. For if you do, then that's the whole reward you're going to get. Is their applause not from God. And so we want to be visible, not showy. And authentic faith is seen in our actions toward people. It's how we love people. It's how we forgive people. It's how we show compassion toward people. So visible faith is seen in our attitude while we're driving. Um, visible faith is seen in our treatment of store clerks and restaurant wait staff. Visible faith is when we're patient, when we're patients at doctor's offices. You see, authentic faith is visible and it's most clearly seen in the midst of crisis and failure and disappointment. So, is your faith visible? Or is it showy? Or is it invisible? Because authentic faith is visible. And then authentic faith is present. Present. And, and if you're taking notes, write down not compartmentalized. Not compartmentalized. Uh, in other words, you represent Jesus. You live by his values, whether you are at church, at home, at work, or at play. Everywhere you go, you're, you're representing Jesus because your faith is present with you everywhere. All the time. I know you may find this hard to believe, and it may shock you that some people actually go to worship on Sunday, and then they cheat people Monday through Friday. I, I know, it's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? There are some people who will, who will you know, confess Jesus at, at church and sing praises to his name beautifully, and then they'll profane his name the rest of the week. There's some people who, believe it or not, will actually bless their friends at church, they'll bless the preachers at church, and, and then they'll go home and curse their spouse and their kids. So is your faith present? Is it real everywhere you go? The Apostle Paul, Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 
because we represent Jesus everywhere you go. Is your faith present? Uh, do you live your faith 24-7 or is it only for a couple of hours a week? Because authentic faith is visible and it's present and authentic faith is honest. And again, right next to that, not correct. You see, church can be a place where we inadvertently teach people of faith how to lie. We, we were really good at raising uh, accidental Pharisees, unintentional hypocrites, because we, we a lot of times encourage people to learn the right answers, what I like to call the Sunday school answers, so that people uh, learn how to present the, the best of their life, really not their honest life. In other words, we have spiritual living rooms where we invite people to see a portion of our life just not the real us. And authentic faith is honest. You see, we're honest. We don't just play the part of being a good Christian. Instead, we're living the truth where, hey, look, the truth is we're a mess that Jesus is redeeming. That, that's the truth. We're a mess. Jesus is redeemed. Authentic ta faith tells the truth about our struggles, about our doubts, about our failures. We, we, we stop trying to hide who we really are because we stop worrying about what people think about us. See, that this is pride in our lives where we start going, well, I don't want people to think badly of me. I don't want to think less of me. So I don't want them to know how I failed. I don't want them to know that, that I'm struggling with that. And the truth is we're all failures and we're all struggling and God loves us anyway and he knows who we are and, and he wants us to do better. He doesn't expect perfection. So let's be honest about our faith. Let's be honest about who we are because all of us have a story of God redeeming our lives. None of us have it all together. So let's be honest about the fact that sometimes we're just enduring. But it's okay because endurance is how God builds character in our lives. And, and sometimes we struggle to forgive and we struggle to feel forgiven and we struggle to, to admit that, hey, I really don't want to learn more. I, I, I just want to just be lazy. Let's be honest about who we are. Let's be honest about God's grace and His goodness and His power to redeem. In other words, let's stop trying to live the lie. Because the pressure is always there to look better than we are, to appear like we've got our lives all together. And, and uh, in the early days, or back in the old days, you know, when, when uh, I was young, people did that by dressing up, going to church, and you know, saying all the right things and trying to put on the, the right appearance. You know how we do it nowadays? Because we're just as proud as they were. Uh, nowadays, it's making your life look perfect on Facebook. You know, that's the question I ask people nowadays. I go, hey, is your life as good as it looks on Facebook? <laughs> I mean, really? Are you that happy? Are you, are you always smiling? Are you, you know, is that, is that your life? Because we're, we're working so hard to present an image to people uh, about our lives because for some reason, we care what they think rather than being concerned with what God thinks. And so we live the lie, and that only leads to frustration and failure, not only for you, but for your family. So is your faith real, or is it fake? Is your faith authentic? Because the Holy Spirit is encouraging you to remodel your living room with authentic faith, because you are responsible for building your life. Now, I know that many of you want to build a family and a house of faith. I know that. So I want to I want to help you. And, and I'm going to get really practical here for a couple of minutes. Um, first of all, we put resources available. Pastor O.C. already shared those with you. They're in your bulletin. If you read books, we put some books in there for you to read. I realize that some of you read books, some of you don't. That's okay. Uh, we just want to give you resources. Don't buy books if you don't read them. That's not really good stewardship. Um, but if you don't read books, we put uh, an access, you know, to videos that you can watch. So, so do something to, to learn more and to encourage yourself and your family. Th those resources are available to you. But I want to get real specific with a challenge here for, for everyone uh, who's a family in this room. Uh, I got a couple of things. Because here's, here's what I want. I really want you to take one concrete step toward building a house of faith this week. And so here's the challenge. Uh, the challenge is this, if, you've, if you're a couple, if you're a couple, I, I want to challenge you to pray together every day for the rest of the month. Because we're doing a series through August, I'm going to encourage you to pray together every day. Some point during the day, in the morning, at night, over meal, whatever, reach over, grab your spouse's hand, and voice a prayer out loud. I know some of you were all in until I said that. 
Because some of you are like, I don't ever pray, I don't pray out loud. Okay, look, I'm not asking you to do it up here on stage. I'm asking you to do it with one person who that you share everything with. So voice a prayer out loud. And, and since a lot of you are like, I don't know what to say, I don't know how to pray, I'm going to give you a sample prayer. You can use it, it's fine. Uh, you can add to it, but here, just do this. If you're, if you're scared to death of doing this, be courageous enough to do this. So guys, grab your wife's hand, and, and you don't even have to close your eyes. You can look her in the eye, but you don't even have to close your eyes. It's easier that way, you know. <laughs> Hug her if you want to, if that makes you feel better, whatever. But just simply pray this. God, thank you for my wife. Let her hear you thank God for her. That, that, that may be the sweetest thing she hears all week long. Thank you for my wife. And here's the second half of that prayer. God, help me to be the husband you created me to be. Help me to be the husband. In other words, you're not praying for God to fix her. <laughs> you're not praying for God to get you know, her to see it your way. You're just asking God to help you be the man he created you to be to bless her. That's it. Wives, you can do the same prayer for your husbands. I, I guarantee you, if, you're, if you'll take that step and you'll do this through the end of this month, it will change the dynamic of your relationship. It will bless you. If, now, if you've got kids at home, your family, and you've got kids at home, or your grandkids are always over at your house, then I'm going to encourage you to pray as a family. Again, it doesn't have to be fancy. Because here's the thing, I know a lot of you are like telling your kids at night, okay, let's go in and say your prayers, and you're, you're listening to your kids pray, and your kids never hear you pray. For them. So pray with your kids. Same type of prayer, it doesn't have to be long, it doesn't have to be fancy. God, thank you for my kids. If you know their names, use them. Uh, and, <laughs> and help me to be the mom or dad that you created me to be. And, and, and you know, do it at, at, you can do it at bedtime. You can do it at mealtime. You can do it when you're in the car because they can't get away. And besides, they're probably praying if you're driving anyway. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it just let it be part of your family. And it, it'll change the dynamic for this month. And see what kind of difference it makes in your life. So take that one concrete step to build your house of faith. And do it this week. Because you are responsible for building your life and building your family. But you got to take the step. And you got to decide that you're going to let the Holy Spirit lead you through this project. Let's pray.